All right, hey, for the first time, we are pleased to be joined by Trey Biddy, Hog Sports 24 7 Sports, part of their network there, but uh, the go to source for Arkansas Sports Info. Trey, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, good to be on with you. First time. Hopefully, not the last. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, I, I've already asked you about the brick, which. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave that off air. But uh, another thing I've always really wanted to ask you, Trey, what was the origin of the walk and talk segments? Yeah. Because they're just so great. And uh, I mean, that's after every Arkansas game, it, it is a must view for all Arkansas fans. It's crazy how popular that's gotten. And in fact, I think if you ask most people who I am, they wouldn't say, oh, the writer, the sports writer, or, you know, they maybe used to say that the guy that's on radio and stuff. But I think now that they would say, oh yeah, walk and talk. <laughs> uh, you know, that started like me and Danny West, who has been with me for about a, uh, 12 years or so on hog sports, you know, we would leave the game and we'd walk to our cars and it was, you know, about a 10 minute walk and we'd just talk about the game, you know? And um, after a while, our parking got changed and mine was at a different spot. And, there was a time where I was doing like standups on the field and I would grab eventually like start grabbing the mic or the, excuse me, the, the, uh, the camera. And I don't know why, but like off the tripod and I, like, you know, showing stuff like that. And, and then I started uh, like walking and, and answering questions on Facebook live. Um, and I don't know, it just kind of meshed. And I don't even know the first time I really did one, if I had planned that I was going to do it, I just was like, well, I'll just do this as I'm walking to my car. Um, I, I'd, I'd intended to do it one time back in like 2016 after, uh, the belt bowl and I didn't know my way around where I was in, in Carolina. And so I didn't do it. I ended up doing it from the hotel room and actually holding a selfie stick like that. So it just kind of evolved into it from like kind of a lot of different things. And, uh, I don't know, I'd never would have expected that it would gotten so popular to where people are like demanding <laughs> that I do it or right after the game, where's the walk and talk. And I'm like, I've got, you know, I've got a press conference. We got to write stuff, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, uh, it's, uh, I'm certainly thankful that it's, uh, that it's been so popular. I think it's one of the things that's helped put us on the map at Hawk sports. Right. It's always an adventure to see if you get locked in during that walk and talk or not. It, it's always, yeah. <laughs> it, it, you never know what you're going to get, but, uh, I was just recapping and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I was just recapping one of one of the most viral ones last year, and it was after Mississippi State. Was that just like the most pathetic game of, of any, yeah. uh, not just football, but, uh, but basically any sport that you've covered there at Hog Sports? Uh, that was an extremely disappointing outcome. I mean, Mississippi State was not very good on offense or defense, and for Arkansas to put up three points and it all coming off of an interception deep in Mississippi State territory, uh, it was really dejecting. And the way that they had played before that against uh, against Florida and, you know, or excuse me, not against Florida, but um, – Oh, I'm getting my games mixed up because Florida came after that. That was when Kenny Guyton was elevated. But, you know, the way that they had played before, I believe it was Alabama, um, you know, playing Alabama on the road and what was it, 24-20? And, you know, playing Ole Miss before that and a 27-21 game, something like that. Uh, and then to come back home and, you know, the expectation was that they were going to come back and, you know, maybe finally get things on track and just to put up such a pathetic offensive performance with the defense playing well as they had most of the year up to that point. Um, yeah, it was really dejecting. And uh, you could see the writing on the wall with Dan Enos that that was his last game here. Um, but, yeah, that was um, – you know, it's, it's interesting because it, for some reason it feels like after a loss more people tune in because I feel like it's – therapeutic for them in some kind of way it's therapeutic for me because I'm just I don't even think about what I'm saying you know and after I get done I get to my car and I'm like well that sucked you know that was <laughs> like nobody's gonna like this everybody has these high expectations for the walk and talk and then I get done with it and like you said you know hey that was one of your better ones or that was my favorite one or that makes me feel a lot better that somebody else feels like I do so it's just I find that when I walk and I do this when I do radio because I do it remotely for 30 minutes at five o'clock on drive time on 1037 the buzz I'm always just pacing walking around in a circle and stuff and I just feel like for some reason it flows out of me better when I'm walking and I don't even really think about what I'm saying it's just I don't know I don't know if other people are built that way or if it's just me yeah, and the reason I bring that up, not to bring up uh, you know bad memories and have Arkansas fans have to relive that, but 
that'll be the moment. If Arkansas can turn things around, I, I think you can kind of pinpoint that game where obviously, as you alluded to, their change had to be made. Mm-hmm. And we're going into, uh, you know, let's let's call it what it is, a, a very hot seat for Sam Pittman. How surprised are you that they even brought Sam Pittman back? Because, I, you know, a lot of people anticipated he wouldn't even be the coach. And that's mm-hmm. that's wild to say, Trey, because – we know. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. He's he's wildly popular. Uh, he's my favorite SEC coach, and, and he's you know he he's an Arkansas man through and through. Yet you know, a couple of years after winning nine games, a lot of fans are are already eager to move on to the next coach. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how surprised were you that they actually brought him back? I was surprised, and I wasn't surprised at the same time. It, you know, part of me agrees with Hunter Urechek, and that you know firing coaches in the state of Arkansas and the you know the climate out there right now maybe that's not the the best uh, thing to do at the same time uh, I don't know I was both surprised and not surprised I mean I'm not going to say I didn't have like a coaching hot board shell ready to go in case it happened um, you know I, I like Sam Pittman and uh, I've always I've always thought that he's a good coach and a good guy and you know I think maybe some people maybe think differently and maybe Sam does too, because I do have a job to do. And that includes asking him questions about job security and things like that. But, uh, I have always hoped that things work out for him because the things that you say, you know, he's a, he's a good sound bite. Um, he seems like a good guy and he seems very Arkansas to me. It just, it hasn't worked out very well. And what's got to change, I think is the idea that, you know, he's still kind of learning on the job and, you know, you're in year five now, so, um, yeah, a little bit surprised that uh, that he was back, but at the same time, not surprised. I'll say this. The thing that I, did, I have learned about coaching changes and stuff, it seems to always happen a year before you think it's going to happen. Like with Brett Bielema, for example, nobody went into that fifth year of his thinking, okay, this is his, his last year if he doesn't get it done. Uh, and it just kind of unfolded throughout the course of the season. Uh, with Chad Morris, even nobody went into that second year thinking, you know, this is this is it for him. So it always seems to happen a year before. In this case, it obviously did not. Um, and the, one of the reasons I think is because you never really know until you're sitting in it throughout the season how things are unfolding. You know, you can be asked all this stuff about the preseason, but you never really know exactly how you feel until these games are unfolding. And as it progressed, I started thinking, man, this could be a very toxic off season. And that is something that you see athletic departments try to avoid all the time. The only thing that I think that they could have possibly done to curb the toxicity, and there's still plenty out there, is to hire a guy like Bobby Petrino. I don't know if they could have hired any other offensive coordinator. I don't care what his record is. Uh, that would have curbed things the way that Bobby Petrino's hire did. I think that was a huge move for Arkansas. I think it was the right time to do it if you were ever going to do it. Uh, and it's, I'm anxious to see what happens as a result of it. But I don't know if they could have done anything else because I've been around toxic offseason, the Houston nut days, you know, when when he was around probably, you know, if you're there anywhere, people start to get tired of you unless you're just a legend, you know, just winning a ton of games. And I just remember how toxic it was uh, for Houston nut. And this was at times when, you know, they were coming off a 10 win season. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it the toxicity, I think, is something that athletic departments try to avoid. But to answer your question, I mean, I was 50 50. Part of me expected him back and. Um, I don't know, maybe I'd say 60, 40 and 60% maybe expected him, um, to not be retained. Yeah. And it, it is interesting. Cause I, that's right where I was going to go with Bobby Petrino. I mean, I, I've, I've been doing this for a good while and I, I cannot think of a coordinator hire that caused like a 180 with the fans. But mm-hmm. now I, I realize again, some fans eager to still move on, but I mean, it, it seemed like it was universal. He's got to go to. Hey, maybe we're cooking with something here. So, could yeah. you could you ever have imagined the day that Bobby Petrino walks back on onto uh, uh, the the hill there, and and uh, maybe not even as head coach, but taking a step down from wh- where he was so successful as a head coach to be the offensive coordinator at Arkansas? It still kind of blows my mind. Yeah, it does. I mean, when I was first told about it before it happened, I was trying to get you know, double confirmation on it just because <laughs> that's not something that you put out because you look like an idiot if it's not true. <laughs> so I was, I was told, Hey, you need to check into this. Bobby Petrino's in Arkansas. He's a real candidate for the offensive coordinator job. So I wasn't able at the time to get double confirmation. And then I think maybe Pete Thamel had, uh, you know, also put some information out about that. And, um, 
you know, eventually I was able to confirm that, that he's going to be the next offensive coordinator at Arkansas. Uh, never would have uh, guessed it. Didn't know that it was possible just through, you know, the bylaws at the University of Arkansas. But they got it worked out. And, um, you know, that happened a long time ago. And so Arkansas fans remember him kind of in a way of like Marilyn Monroe where she was – you know, in her prime in a, in a lot of sense, you know, she was, you never saw, you know, the downfall or anything like that. She just, you know, she died. And I'm not saying obviously that he died, but he just, you know, he, he left after winning 11 games and winning 10 games right, right before that. And so there was never any opinion other of him other than, you know, things are going in the right direction and stuff. And, you know, I think Louisville probably had the same idea and things obviously, you know, went well for a little while and then they didn't. And now they have a different opinion of him, but that's where he is in Arkansas's mind. He's the guy that took Arkansas to 10 wins, 11 wins, had this great explosive offense. And so there's, um, you know, there's kind of a, uh, a romance, I guess, with, with Arkansas fans and Bobby Petrino. And so now it's, now he's back and, yeah, I mean, if Arkansas can get to a point where, like, they can take some of the things that they did in the past on offense, like, you know, and it's a different offense, but, you know, 2022, they were, you know, very good on offense. 2021, they led the Power Five in rushing. If they can get some of that offense back, and I think they can with Bobby Petrino, he just sees things differently. If they can get some of that stuff back, combined with how they play defense the first three quarters of the season, then maybe they'll have something uh, with this team, you know, but – um I don't know. They haven't been able to put both sides of the ball together yet. So right. maybe that's too much to ask. And how much of that hinges on the offensive line? Cause I've seen you write oh, yeah. about it at hog sports uh, and now add it to the mix. Andrew Chamblay is no longer with the program. How much more difficult does that make it with new offensive coordinator, new offensive line coach, Eric Mateos at, at, how, how feasible is it that they have a, you know, they don't even have any, have any elite offensive line, but just a capable offensive line this fall. Yeah, just getting a capable offensive line. And that's things that I look back at at Petrino and his time at Arkansas before. You know, they had some good offensive lines. That 2010 offensive line was pretty good. The 2011 offensive line wasn't as good. And they still won 11 games. So it's not about, like, just getting to a point where you just have one NFL guy after another. That'd be great. But just getting a guy, a, you know, a bunch of scrappy guys that fight and believe and will strain for you. Um, I think that's part of it. Uh, I was always a fan of Eric Mateos when he was here at Arkansas as a grad assistant. And then, you know, of course, moving on through the ranks. Uh, I think he's a good offensive line coach. Didn't have a whole lot of success at Baylor last year. Uh, I just thought that last year they were asking Arkansas offensive linemen to do a lot of things that they just weren't really capable of doing under Danny Enos' offense. And, uh, you know, K.J. Jefferson, I don't think it was just a good fit for that. I think that was – the idea was that would be a natural progression for him, you know, help him maybe take his game to where he can show, you know, NFL scouts that he can do this type of offense. And it just didn't fit. I mean, to think that he was sacked, I think, 47 times. Think about how many times you saw K.J. Jefferson shut tacklers I mean, the dude was 245 pounds and was mobile and stout, and he still was sacked 45 times. And it wasn't all on the offensive line. The tight ends played a role. Um, the running back seemed confused when it comes to pass pro. The whole scheme just didn't work for him. And plus, they were pretty young. You know, Shambly, who we mentioned, who's just, I guess, going to be a regular student now. Um, what I was saying about him was like, yeah, he's 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 got potential, but he's not quite ready yet. And then, you know, Devon Manuel gets hurt, and Shambly's forced in that situation. You got Patrick Kudis, who's just 19 years old, you know, trying to play tackle, and they've moved him into guard, which I think will be a better fit for him. So, you know, they had some personnel issues. I think they were there was a lot of hoping that the offensive line would come along, and it just never really did. And then I think the scheme also really impacted them. Uh, I, I think the offensive line will be better. It's just a matter of how much better are they going to be. Uh, for Ma Fernando Carmona, I think, was a huge addition for them out of San Jose State. He'll play left tackle. Uh, you know, he's not going to start a transfer day one of spring. They're going to have to work their way into it. But he's your start starting left tackle of the future. I think Addison Nichols will eventually start for them also. Um, they probably, you know, Branson Hickman is a guy out of SMU. They're getting a visit from this coming weekend who can play center. You know, he would be a potential starter, I think, former All-AAC performer, 33 games under his belt as a starter. Uh, he's another guy. Keyshawn Blackstock is another one. I think maybe he'll be more of a battle with uh, Marion Harris and Takias Crawford. So, and, and Joshua Braun is back. Um, so, I think that they, if they can – if they can find what their strengths are and um, 
and I think they've improved their personnel overall, then maybe they can be better. They still need to add two more offensive linemen out of the transfer portal. They have 13. That's just not enough on scholarship. They've got just lost one guy for the season uh, in Zuri Madison. He's, he's just a freshman, but still, you got to have minimum 15 scholarship offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it's early, but uh, any thoughts on the quarterback competition? I was pretty surprised Sam Pittman came out here and said, hey, you know, if we can name a starter at the end of the spring. Now, that used to be common, but not in the yeah. portal NIL world. It, it's like they have to wait till game day to, to name a starter. Um, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of quarter, uh, a lot of battles, but quarterback is obviously yeah. one that draws a lot of attention. You mentioned in a recent interview that you'd like to have it, I think, wrapped up in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. I think we can. I think, you know, uh, with some of the things that we're doing, seven on seven, you know, you'll, we'll be able to – it's going to be a lengthier period, more reps and things of that nature. We need to. We have to to see who can throw and, and who can catch for that matter. Um, and then we need help and, you know, we need work in the secondary because we did bring in through three new guys in the secondary too. So we made a uh, – that period used to been 12 minutes. We went to 20. Uh, trying to make sure everybody gets the right amount of reps so we can get the evaluations on both the quarterback, the receivers, and the safeties and the corners. Uh, so we have added that added that part of it. But the quarterback battle, um, you know, there's uh, basically probably five guys in there vying for that spot, you know, obviously with Taylor and Malachi and Chris and, and – uh, I like Ledbetter. I mean, him coming over from baseball, he's 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 done a nice job of showing his leadership ability and anything. And then I think we've got something special in KJ Jackson uh, for our future, and and so we need to figure out all that kind of stuff. And and uh, excited to get going with that battle. Uh, do you think that that's realistic? And and does that maybe clue you into to maybe Bobby Petrino favors one guy over another? What would you make of those comments? Well, I don't think he would have said it if he didn't mean it, and, and if that wasn't the intent, because why would you say that? <laughs> you know. Uh, so I, I'll say this about Bobby Petrino: he went out and identified Taylor Green, and Taylor Green reminds me—I'm not saying he's a four-three-nine, forty-yard dash, but he's fast, and people take terrible angles on him. He reminds me a lot of Matt Jones from people I've talked to, sources close to the program. He's listed at six-six. He looks taller than other six-six guys on the team. Um, long strider. He's got kind of a little bit of a low-throwing motion. Those are things that I think maybe could be improved with Bobby Petrino. But this is a guy that led Boise State to 10 wins, was freshman, retro, well, he's a retro freshman, but he was uh, Mountain West freshman of the year, offensive freshman of the year, I think. Um, had some issues last season. They had a coaching change. Ends up MVP of the, um, of the conference championship game, the Mountain West conference championship game. I think that this also stuck out to me, Mike. This is from probably 2010. 2009, something like that. Uh, there was a recruiting class that Petrino brought in, and I'd mentioned to him, hey, everybody in this recruiting class is listed at 6'1". And he goes, yeah, well, you know, if you want to be a big team, you got to recruit big players. And he would also always say uh, he feels like a good big guy beats a good little guy 100% of the time. Taylor Green's a big guy at 6'6". Six, six. I think that that's intriguing to him, his size, his running ability. Uh, now, I think Jacoby Criswell has a lot of intriguing qualities, too. The guy throws a really nice tight spiral every single time, has really good velocity, probably the strongest on the arm on the team uh, based on all the quarterbacks they had last year, including K.J. Jefferson, uh, a guy that's played behind some really good players, um, Sam Howell, Drake May at North Carolina, K.J. Jefferson at Arkansas. Uh, but he's a senior already, though, you know, so um, – I also hear that Taylor Green is very well liked and very uh, popular amongst teammates just in these last couple of months, and that obviously matters for quarterback too. I would give him the edge just because of you know Bobby Petrino doesn't have any preconceived ideas really on either of those quarterbacks. This is the guy that he went out and targeted and got, and um, and Jacoby Criswell six two two thirty. You know, I'm not saying he's a little <laughs> guy, but you know, having a guy that size I think um, is intriguing also. Mm -hmm. What what do you think is the key to, for the defense to be a little bit more consistent? Because I mm -hmm. I thought they were very surprising early in the season, just yeah. just how far they were able to come. And but the last month, I mean, it was pretty pretty bad. But I I don't know if that's you know because the offense was giving them nothing. I don't know if that was competition. How, how mm -hmm. do we get a more consistent defense all year if we're uh, Travis Williams? So I think that, uh, you know, again, the first three quarters of the season, the defense is really good. I mean, like, 
the LSU second half was rough. Well, the really the last drive right before the second half, they had shut LSU down pretty well that whole first half. And, you know, uh, Jaden Daniels took over. I mean, he did that to a lot of people, obviously. Uh, But the defense just kind of let go of the – not let go of the rope, but um, I think kind of – well, maybe kind of like threw their hands up the last half – the last three quarters – excuse me, the last quarter of the season. Um, You know, it's really started with that – well, the Florida game, there was some points allowed, obviously, but it went into overtime. That wasn't just a terrible defensive performance. Um, the Auburn game is really the one where you looked out there and said, man, they look like they just don't want to be out there. And then the uh, Missouri game, they just played really poorly. And I don't know if that's part in part like people looking like you're at the end of the season. What is my future going to look like at Arkansas? Am I going to hit the transfer portal? You know, the offense isn't giving us anything, and we're out here battling and battling, and it's still just – you know, eventually, I think you you, you just kind of let go of the rope, and and that's what I think happened to the defense. But the first three quarters of the season, even the games you looked at where there was a lot of points scored, like BYU put a good number of points, it wasn't because of the defense. I mean, you can look at how all those points are scored. There's special teams issues. Um, you know, the offense, um, excuse me, maybe turning the ball over. Uh, really, I would look at it and say LSU, the second half of LSU, and Texas A&M, you know, Texas A&M got him pretty good also early in the season. But aside from that, you have to go all the way to the Auburn game, in my opinion, for the defense kind of started waning a little bit. So they were much improved overall uh, from the previous year, no question. It was a really bad defense and a really bad secondary in 2022. Yeah. All right. Last thing for you, Trey. Really appreciate your time. But yeah, where does I got a bus Ar- saw going behind me? I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, where Where do things stand with NIL and, and Sam Pittman's support of that? Because like it or not, I mean, I, that's just that's the game now. And and I, yeah. you just look at Ole Miss, look at Missouri, Tennessee, you know, Florida State, on and on and on. If if you can get support, if you can get people giving you the NIL, uh, I think that's the key to to a potential mm-hmm. turnaround at Arkansas. Yeah, I, I, for Arkansas especially, I think you're 100 percent right. Arkansas is more remote; it's a smaller state, three million people. It doesn't produce per capita near what Mississippi or or Louisiana does. Uh, in terms of talent. So they have to reach farther out. I think people would actually be surprised at how much money Arkansas spends on NIL compared to their peers. Uh, I think the misconception is Arkansas is not doing enough, not spending enough, but the deals that the players are getting are actually pretty good. You don't keep a Landon Jackson uh, out of the transfer portal or turning pro because you don't pay him enough or Jalen Braxton, a really promising cornerback. You don't go out and get Fernando Carmona um, by lowballing him, you know? So, um, the deals are there. The money, you know, is being paid out. Now, I think there has been a bit of a transition from going from one Arkansas to Arkansas Edge, the new NIL collective that Arkansas is using. Um, I don't know that one Arkansas was doing a whole lot there towards the end and just the transition of it all. And maybe they're a little bit behind where they want to be. There's still plenty of time to get there, obviously. Um, but, yeah, Arkansas and NIL can – um, and the transfer portal can absolutely help take this program to another level, but it has to be embraced fully. Obviously, um, you have to be proactive in it. You can't say you can't be like, "Well, I'm going to see if they win, or I'm going to see if there's a coaching change, and then maybe I'll donate to NIL." Because no coach is coming <laughs> to Arkansas <laughs> unless they feel like the NIL situation is in great shape. Um, so you have to be proactive with NIL. You have to embrace the transfer portal as much as we're frustrated with transfer portal and NIL situation and stuff. This is really a way where Arkansas can take things to another level because guys who've already been through the recruiting process and maybe pick their hometown school or something, you know, they recognize that when they get to college that things aren't like they were when they were being recruited. And eventually they want to find a place where not only is the money right, but where they really fit in and where there's playing opportunities for them. That's where Arkansas can close the gap on other schools because uh, it's much harder to do it in just recruiting. But at the same time, in recruiting, you know, let's not lie about it. You know, schools are out there buying athletes, you know, out of the high school ranks. That's just what's going on. And so, um, you know, if you're Arkansas, you have to reach a little bit farther and you, you may have to spend more money than than somebody like, you know, in the state of Georgia or somebody with a, a, a talent pool right next door to them, which Arkansas is, you know, five and a half hours away from Dallas. That's a little bit farther than you'd like to be from, you know, a big talent base like that. Yeah. All right, Trey, uh, before you go, I, I know all the Arkansas fans listening know who you are, but the rest of the SEC, how can they follow you and how can they find your work? 
Yeah, I'm easy to follow. I'm at Trey Biddy, T-R-E-Y-B-I-D-D-Y on Twitter, on Instagram, um, just about everywhere, I guess. And we are at hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com. It's part of the 24-7 Sports Network, and we've been there for, I guess, going on six years now. So uh, we're at Rivals before that. 21 years uh, I've been the publisher at Hog Sports, both at Rivals and now at 24-7 Sports. And, uh, yeah, come on and check us out. Check out Danny West and Connor Goodson, Jackson McAfee, our whole team over there at Hog Sports.